There's no denying that the domestication of plants and animals has had a huge impact on our lives. Without it, we would probably still be living the hunter-gatherer lifestyle today. The domestication of animals has provided us with food, transport, clothes, hunting companions, fertilizer, as well as friendly companions. But have you ever wondered why we've only been able to domesticate some animals and not others? Why don't we have pet pandas or ride zebras instead of horses? And how does domestication change an animal? In his book Guns, Germs and Steel, Jared Diamond outlines six reasons why some animals have never successfully been domesticated. Before we look at these, it's important to understand what we mean by domesticated. We can define it as a species bred in captivity and thereby modified from its wild ancestors in ways making it more useful to humans who control its reproduction and its food supply. This definition makes a distinction between animals which have been born and reared in captivity and wild animals which have simply been captured and tamed. If you want to domesticate an animal, you have to be able to feed it. Typically, the conversion of food biomass into the consumer's biomass involves an efficiency of around 10%. This means that it takes around 10,000 pounds of corn to grow a 1,000 pound cow. So if you wanted to grow a 1,000 pound carnivore, you would have to feed it 10,000 pounds of herbivore grown on 100,000 pounds of corn. This is why no mammalian carnivore has ever been domesticated for food. Animals which grow slowly, such as elephants and gorillas, just aren't worth domesticating. For example, female elephants aren't ready to breed until they are about 14 years of age, making it much cheaper to just capture them in the wild and tame them. Some animals have proved impossible to successfully breed in captivity. Cheetahs would make excellent hunting companions, but attempts to domesticate them have failed due to the fact that in the wild, male cheetahs will chase the female for several days, which just isn't possible inside a caged area. From the more obvious, such as grizzly bears, to the unsuspecting hippo, which kill 500 humans each year, some animals are just too dangerous to try to domesticate. This is one of the reasons why zebras have proved too difficult to domesticate, as they have a tendency to bite people and not let go. Animals react differently to danger. Those which are nervous, fast and programmed for instant flight in the face of a threat are unsurprisingly difficult to keep in captivity. Gazelles are a good example of this, as they will run off at the first sign of danger, making them impossible to herd. Hey. They can run up to 50 miles per hour and will also panic and blindly bash themselves against walls to try to escape. The social structure of a species is incredibly important for domestication, with almost all species of domesticated large mammals sharing three social characteristics. The first is living in herds, as this makes it possible to keep them in captivity in relatively small spaces and to move them where you want to. The second is a well-developed dominance hierarchy, as young animals will imprint on people as well as members of their own species, allowing humans to take over the hierarchy as their leader. Finally, the herds must occupy overlapping home ranges rather than exclusive territories, so that they don't fight each other when penned into small crowded spaces. So, there are the six reasons why we have never domesticated certain animals. In fact, just looking at large mammals, only 14 out of a possible 148 species were domesticated before the 20th century. But in what ways can domestication change a wild animal? To understand this, we can look at an experiment conducted by the Soviet Union, which began in 1959. The experiment, led by Dmitry Baileyev, attempted to domesticate wild foxes by selectively breeding for tameness and low aggression. When the fox pups reached sexual maturity at around 8 months old, they were given a score for tameness. Less than 20% of the foxes were allowed to breed, ensuring only the tamest and least aggressive towards humans were passing on their genes. Perhaps unsurprisingly, after many generations of breeding, these domesticated foxes were more eager to hang out with humans than wild foxes. They wagged their tails when happy or excited, whimpered to attract attention, and were more eager to explore new situations. They changed physically too, 
with many of them having floppy ears, short or curly tails, and changes in fur coloration. Even the shape of their skulls, jaw, and teeth changed. Baliev and his colleagues found that the domestication affected the genes controlling the neural hormonal status. They hypothesized that some of the genes responsible for the association between tameness and hormonal and transmitter levels might have been brought together and became fixed. This fixation might have in turn modified the activity of many other downstream genes, thereby destabilizing and shifting development timing and uncovering some of the phenotypically hidden potentialities of the genome which means that the interactions between genetic variations altered during selection might have produced new patterns of gene expression and new phenotypes. What we do know is that the experiment was a success, and the changes which occurred in the foxes can be found in other domesticated animals, in particular man's best friend, which was domesticated from wolves around 15,000 years ago. Thanks for watching. This video was inspired by the book Guns, Germs and Steel by Jared Diamond, which explores why human history has unfolded so differently across the globe. If you want to check it out, I'll leave a link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, then you can subscribe by clicking here, and you can watch a playlist of my other videos by clicking here. See you next time.